So let me know whenever uh, it's okay for me to start, Prabhu. Yeah, we are ready, Prabhu. You can start, okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Cheva Narottamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Udhirai Nashta Preshu Badreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavata Uttam Shloke Bhaktir Bhavatir Naishtaki Om Agyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Mukham Kuroti Vachanam Pangam Langite Girim Yat Kripatam Aham Vande Shri Guru Dinataranam Hare Krishna, thank you for uh, uh, joining this uh, um, of our routine uh, cycle. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to complete the, the prayers of Queen Kunti Devi. We may not be able to complete the chapter, but I think we should be able to complete the prayers of Queen Kunti Devi. There are uh, five verses, six verses left there. Concluding verses are, uh, well, a few of them are, uh, are uh, uh, have uh, more uh, realizations embedded in them. So we will start with the uh, 1839. Neam sab neam shabis yate tatra yate dan im gadadara tvat pade rankita bhati lakshana vilakshitaha O gadadar Krishna, our kingdom is now being marked by the impressions of your feet, and therefore it appears beautiful. But when you leave, it will no longer be. So, so in the previous set of verses, Kunti Devi was talking about the impact of Krishna leaving. So she was talking about the impact on herself. Then she expanded the impact to her family. She said, our family is vulnerable. Now she's expanding the impact to the entire kingdom. And she's saying that when you were over here, then everything was auspicious or everything is auspicious. And when you leave, then it won't be anymore. So this is very much like the realizations of uh, Sanjay. At the end of Bhagavad Gita, he, he tells uh, Dhritarashtra. Uh, this is, I think the last, this is the very last verse in the Bhagavad Gita, 1878. When he says that wherever there is Krishna, master of the mystics, and wherever there is Arjun, the supreme archer, there certainly will be opulence, victory, power, and morality. So, so that is the auspiciousness that one gets by having Krishna present in their lives or, or, or in the environment, one way or the other. So Kunti Devi, she addresses Krishna as Gadadhar. So Gadadhar translates to one who bears a Gada, one who holds a mace. So Krishna has a mace by the name of Pamadaki. And really speaking, Krishna does not have a mace. Lord Vishnu has a mace. So he's Chatur, Krishna, Krishna has two arms, Lord Vishnu is Chaturbhuj. And he has a mace and a Sudarshan Chakra, and he has a Shank and a Padma. So two of the paraphernalia is for the devotees, which is the, the Shank and the Padma, 
and two are for the non devotees which is the 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 chakra and the gada so kunti devi uh, previously she talked about how krishna appeared and she he he reduced the burden of the earth by uh, causing the causing the annihilation of the of the impious kings so so by addressing krishna as gadadhar she is invoking that aspect of krishna the dusht daman aspect the aspect of krishna by which he he keeps the miscreants under control because there otherwise there is no reason for her to call krishna gadadhar krishna is standing in the two arm form but she is invoking the the, the chaturbhuj vishnu form to to bring bring forth that aspect to krishna's attention that as gadadhar as the builder of the komataki uh, uh, club you have you have annihilated the the miscreants then she calls attention to krishna's lotus feet so she says our kingdom is now being marked by the impressions of your feet so we know that krishna's lotus feet has how many markings 19 markings 11 of them are on his right feet and 8 of them are on his left feet and this particular combination of markings are unique to krishna so only krishna has it so one may question that uh, if krishna is walking in the kingdom with his bare feet and then he is leaving his markings then won't they eventually be be overwritten by by sand by the winds by other people or animals walking over and this is actually explained in in the in the vrindavan leela so who's the other great personality who was greatly inspired by the markings of the lotus feet of krishna so that was akrura so when 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 akrura entered into vrindavan then one of the first things that he saw was krishna's the impressions of krishna's lotus feet on braj bhumi and uh, he was so much taken in he he jumped off his chariot he rolled into the ground and uh, he offered really wonderful prayers and that is why akrura is said to that's how akrura he perfected his his uh, spiritual life through the process of vandanam by by reciting prayers and the impetus for this prayers was the 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 darshan of the of the impressions of the lotus feet of krishna he didn't even see krishna's actual feet but just the impressions of the feet in the in the sand and the acharyas explained that when krishna walks he leaves behind his impressions and nobody else walks over there not only does nobody else walk there but even the wind and the water and the and and the sand they all preserve those those impressions so that is why akura was able to see them in the in the sands of raj bhumi and that is why kunti devi is also saying that when you when you leave behind these impressions they are the they are the source of auspiciousness so she is saying is gadadhar krishna you came and you annihilated the miscreants <clears throat> now your lotus feet is the shelter of the devotees so you have taken care of the non devotees now please take care of the devotees so she is making this this uh, uh, heartfelt argument that uh, for the for the non devotees you came and you stayed for so many days now that the non devotees are annihilated ogadadhar 
please stay here for your for your devotees so in the purport Srila Prabhupada says that the land of Hastinapur was thus marked while Lord Krishna was there with the Pandavas and the kingdom of Pandavas thus flourished by such auspicious signs. Kunti Devi pointed out these distinguished features and was afraid of ill luck in the absence of the Lord. And this is not just Kunti Devi. This applies to all of us. As long as we have Krishna's lotus feet in our life, our life will be auspicious. If we separate ourselves from Krishna's lotus feet, then that auspiciousness will go away. So in the Padma Puran, Krishna says to Narad, he says, O Narad, I am not in Vaikuntha, nor am I in the hearts of the yogis. I remain where my devotees glorify my name, form, qualities, and transcendental pastimes. So one may question that how do we keep the lotus feet of Krishna in our lives? Kunti Devi had Krishna right there. We don't have that. So Srila Prabhupada says that by following this, this injunction from Krishna to Narad Muni, that he is personally present wherever there is glorification of his Naam, Roop, Gun, Leela. And when he is personally present there, then there is all auspiciousness. So related to this, Srila Prabhupada, he talks about a more mystical reason of why devotees live in holy dhams. And uh, especially Vrindavan Dham. And the point Prabhupada makes is the genuine devotees, they can associate with Krishna. They can associate with Krishna in the form of the name. They can associate with his deity forms. They can associate with him through his, his words in the scriptures. And they are, not, they are not empty sentimentalists. So sometimes people go to holy dhams out of sentimentality. Sometimes they go for material reasons. I go to Holy Dham. The mercy component is stronger. But uh, uh, in the purport of third canto, first chapter, verse 24, Prabhupada says, there are still many devotees of the Lord lingering there in ecstasy in search of Krishna and his childhood associates, the gopis. It is not that such devotees meet Krishna face to face in that tract of land. But a devotee is eagerly searching for Krishna is as good as seeing him personally. How this is so cannot be explained. But it is factually realized by those who are pure devotees of the Lord. Philosophically, one can understand that Lord Krishna and his, and his remembrance are on the absolute plane. And that the very idea of searching for him at Vrindavan in pure God consciousness gives more pleasure to the devotees than seeing him face to face. Such devotees of the Lord see him face to face at every moment as confirmed in the Brahma Samhita 538. So this is the verse Premanjana Churuti Bhakti Vilochanena Santasa Devi Deshu Vilopayanti. So Prabhupada is making this point that the devotees stay in the holy place not because they have this sentimental expectation that Krishna is also is also lurking somewhere in the in the holy dham. But they do so to intensify their meditation. And that is why the whole Krishna leaves behind the holy dhams. That when we go to Govardhan, we see that, okay, this is where, where Krishna did this Leela. This is where with, with the Gopas, he, he, had, uh, he had fight with the milk and yogurt. So as you circumambulate Govardhan, there are so many spots where 
different leelas with respect to Krishna is, is performed. And Prabhupada is saying that that eagerness, that eagerness by which one is looking for Krishna, not with the expectation of finding him, but just looking for him. These are the pastimes of Krishna. These are the places where, where, where Krishna um, sat or left his, left his footprint. That is at the same level as being with Krishna. So does anybody know that what is this bhav called? Lollium. I know. I mean, it's not like bhav. I mean, I was just thinking lollium, but uh, I'm not sure if that is like a bhav. But the, the oh, intense yeah, desire, yeah. grief. Desire is desire is there. This something. So let me read this expert excerpt from Srila Prabhupada's teachings of Queen Kunti in chapter 22. Prabhupada says that Krishna cannot be absent from a devotee when the devotee is intensely absorbed in Krishna's thought. Here, Kunti Devi is very anxious thinking that Krishna will be absent. But the actual effect of Krishna's physical absence is that he becomes more intensely present. So this is the definition of that bhav. That the actual effect of the absence means that he becomes more intensely present. So that is known as vipralamba bhav. So vipralamba bhav is associating in the mood of separation. And this is one of the most esoteric and the highest bhav that is seen only in Vrindavan and only in, by, the, by, the, by, by the, uh, uh, the gopis. The other bhav that most of the, most of the their exalted devotees, but not exalted as the gopis, they demonstrate is the sambhog bhav, where they want to enjoy with Krishna. Now, they don't want to enjoy separately with Krishna, but the enjoyment is in association with Krishna. But Prabhupada says that the reason Vipralamba is superior to, to Sambhu because in Vipralamba Bhav, you don't even need Krishna. You can associate with Krishna even when Krishna is not, it's not predicated on anything. In Sambhu, there is always this fear that when you're associating with Krishna, Krishna will go away. So in the morning, the uh, Yashoda Mai, she has this fear that as the sun rises in the sky, the time for Krishna to leave the house and go and go for, along with his Gopa friend is coming. And then there is this elaborate pastime of Yashoda Mai, which she lets Krishna go all the way till the door and she calls him back. And then she lets him go a little bit more to the garden and she calls him. And then when he's a little bit further down, then she keeps following him. Just making excuses. Have you got the food? Do you have something for, for drinking? Because that Sambhog Bhav is, is predicated on, on, on the physical association, which will at some point end. Vipralimba Bhav, there's no fear. Krishna is not there at all. So there's no fear. So that bhav only gets intensified more and more. And these, these Prabhupada says these advanced topics are, are, are revealed to us by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Maha, Mahaprabhu. So Kunti Devi at this point is not pretending to be at a Vipralamba Bhav. She is strongly demonstrating the mood of associating and enjoying or enjoying the protection or enjoying the happiness in the association of Krishna. Okay, we'll do the next verse. Any questions on this one? Okay, 1840. Imejana padaha sruddhaha Supakwa osadi viruddha Vanadri nadya udanvata 
All these cities and villages are flourishing in all respects because the herbs and the grains are in abundance. The trees are full of fruits, the rivers are flowing, the hills are full of minerals, and the oceans full of wealth. And this is all due to your glancing over. So this part of the prayer demonstrates the mood of, of gratitude. So Kunti Devi is expressing a strong sense of gratitude to, to uh, uh, Krishna. And if you look at the verse, you know, these days there is so much talk about environmental disasters and scarcity and imbalance. And Prabhupada says that this describes a flourishing, a perfectly balanced ecosystem. And there's only one thing that needs to be done to make it happen, which is to obtain the glance of Krishna. So uh, Prabhupada writes, and Prabhupada's purport is, even though it's almost uh, 50 years old, but it's equally relevant now. Because he talks about that the more we attempt to exploit material nature according to our whims of enjoyment, the more we shall become entrapped by the reaction of such exploitive attempts. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> if we have sufficient grains, fruits, vegetables, and herbs, what is the necessity of running a slaughterhouse and killing poor animals? So the, all this attempt for us to create prosperity is maybe giving some limited short-term returns, but we are definitely not doing our future generations any favor. So one thing is for certain, that we will leave the earth a much worse place than we inherited it. And, and, and the rate of decline will, if anything, increase. I was reading today that uh, the largest concentration of, of pollution is on the ocean. So it's a collection between uh, uh, south of Hawaii and it's a collection of plastics and, uh, and other such stuff, which is three times the size of Texas. And they were, they were, they were saying it's like 1.4 million tons or something like that. And it's growing. So that's the legacy that we are going to leave to our future generation. So, so Kunti Devi here is describing a completely different picture. Cities and villages are flourishing in all respects. There is herbs and grains, there is trees full of fruits, the rivers are flowing, which means it's raining, the hills are full of mineral. So Prabhupada would say that because India was abundant in this wealth, that everybody was coming to India. That the land was full of was was full of minerals. Those kind of minerals were not found anywhere else. Now they've all been mined and depleted, but that was the reason that everybody was was trying to come to come to India. So how has all this been made possible? Kunti Devi says that because Krishna has glanced. Just by the glance of Krishna, all this has become possible. Now we had some discussion about the glance of Krishna in verse 22 of this, uh, this chapter. So, so we, had said, we had said that how Krishna by his glance, he creates, he maintains, he nourishes and he, and he uh, destroys. So um, here Kunti Devi, she is glorifying the, the nourishing and the maintenance aspect of Krishna's glance. So eyes is, is Aksha. And Akshena means that the living entities that take birth because of the Lord's glance. So as long as Krishna continues to glance upon nature, the material world will 
continue to exist. Akshena. That, that through the glands, the living entities are, are actually being, uh, being maintained in the material world. So, so the flip side of it is that for us to actually flourish, we need to take access to that glance of Krishna. So that is why Kunti Devi says, Tava Vikshita. That as long as we have access to your glance, everything is all right. So if we just in our in our in our meditation, if we plead for Krishna's glance, then that is the that is that, that is the perfection of our of our med meditation. So there, there is a there's there is an interesting pastime or an incident that that was shared by Radhanath Maharaj. And uh, there is a there is a very uh, opulent uh, devotee in Mumbai, and I forget his name. Is it Mafatlal? Does it is Mafatlal? He owns a big industrial like a uh, clothing complex or something. Mafatlal. Mafatlal is in Pune. No, Mafatlal is the association with RNS. Radhanath Swami. Yeah, 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 he's in Pune. So maybe this took in, took place in Pune, but apparently he was once standing in front of the deities, and then there was a person who was standing in front of the deities, and then he basically walked into him and he kind of crashed into him. So Mahathlal is apparently a very pious person, very very sattvic, but he got a little irritated, and then he said that you know can't you see where you're going? So the man turned around and he said, I'm blind. I, I actually can't see. <clears throat> so Mahatlal said, uh, what's his name? Shri, Shriji, Shri, Shri, Srinath, right? Srinath Prabhu. I think his name is Srinath. So as I'm saying, I'm recollecting more about the lecture. So Srinath Prabhu then, you know, he said, he, he said, you're standing here, you're blind. Why are you standing over here? So he said that I have come here only to receive the glance of Krishna. I have only come here to, to, and he says it, he says, I have come here to do my roll call. That your servant is over here. Please, please give your glance on him. Any service that you would like me to do, please order me to do so. And then Srinath Prabhu was saying that it was such a powerful realization of of your actual constitutional position with respect to to Krishna. So we go and we and and so this is Radhanath Maharaj saying that we go and we give our darshan to the deities. That we have come. Please, please, please see that we have come. And this person is not able to see the deities. But he has come he has come to actually take darshan of the of the of the deities, he is blind, but Krishna is not. And for him, being in the presence of the deities is receiving the glance of the of the of the deities. There is a similar pastime also in Banki Bihari temple, slightly, but it's it's from much older time, but but very 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 uh, very similar uh, in nature. <clears throat> so Prabhupada. In concluding in the purport, he says that when sincere souls try to become, uh, so this is not his purport, uh, uh, this, is, this is from a lecture. When sincere souls try to become Krishna's devotees, Krishna very kindly comes before them in his full opulences and glances upon them. And they become happy and beautiful. So this is Kunti Devi's prayer. This verse is Kunti Devi's prayer of gratitude and, and asking for the continued glance, continued glance of Krishna to maintain that, the prosperity that his glance had given. Okay, go to next verse. Any questions on this? 
So, Prabhuji, um, like material prosperity, does that mean that it is uh, it is Krishna's favorable glance? That... Yes, that's a very good point. That uh, um, uh, many times the the conception is, and this point actually gets made in the next verse. The conception is that prosperity is a bad thing, and it's not. It's only bad if it is separate from Krishna. If it is connected with Krishna, then yes. If Krishna is giving us prosperity, then that is Krishna's prasad. They, uh, there were some associates of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who were very poor. And there were some who were very rich. And he was equally favorable to them. So whether they were rich or poor was incidental. The main thing was that they were, uh, uh, they were devotees. And Toji, like, uh, I mean, since the past couple few verses, actually since 37, I think, uh, uh, where, like, you know, where since, so she's basically saying that, um, like, you know, it, she's basically like, it feels like she's asking for like material protection and material uh, rather than like more internal, like, you know, remove the last anger, greed or whatever, like, you know, I mean, that, I mean, of course, like she is a pure devotee and she's teaching us, but she doesn't have... Um, but um, so, there, so there, I, 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 I um, understand the point you're making. So the point that 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 is coming through. So of course the prayers are still not over. Um, so she'll continue to ask for more things. But the point that comes through in these in these set of verses is, and it's relevant to the previous question you had asked, that um, everything related with with Krishna is good. So she's saying, I got, I, so what has she asked from Krishna so far? She had protection. She's saying that, you know, these kings will come and attack me. So what is she saying? Protect my body. That's what they will attack, right? If the kings come, they will attack uh, not her body, but the, her son's body. So when she's saying protect, protect my relatives, protect my, protect my body. Make sure that I have enough fruits in the plants. Make sure that I have enough minerals in the in the in the hills so this is the mood of a this is this is the mood of a of a materialistic materialistic devotee but even if the prayers go to stop at this point they're still glorious because she's asking them from only krishna because every time she asks she also displays this mood of exclusive dependence so so that is the mood that is prominent. Because if you look at it this way, if our relationship with Krishna is spiritual, how can anything material impact? It's a spiritual relationship. Whether you get material opulence or you don't get material opulence, it's not going to impact. So whether, this, whether, whether a mother's son is a highly placed official or not a highly placed official, it does not matter. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, may, it may matter to his friends or to other people, but not to the mother. Because that relationship has nothing to do with all that stuff. But now if the son is highly placed, then the mother will live in a big house. If not, then she may live in a simple house. But the relationship does not get, get uh, changed in any way. Same thing between Krishna and 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 uh, and Kunti Devi, she may be asking for a big bungalow and a car and 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 and, and a color TV, but she's asking in the mood of exclusive dependence. That that because you are there, in the in in two verses before that we had said right the the, the mode of surrender that Krishna uh, Kunti Devi is is demonstrating that everything good in my life is because of Krishna. Everything bad in my life is because of me, myself, and my position is that of exclusive shelter of Krishna. So in that framework, she's making all this, she's, put, she, she's writing all these requests. So that's why they're glorious. Um, and, to, and complete dependence means that uh, like she's not seeking shelter anywhere else, right? So that's... that's um, so, so that is exclusive shelter, and she has both. She has complete shelter and exclusive shelter. 
So exclusive shelter means that she is not seeking shelter from anywhere else. Complete shelter is for everything she's taking shelter for Krishna. See, if Kunti Devi had this mood saying that uh, um, um, I will only ask Krishna for X things, but not for Y things. Right? So that is partial, the partial shelter. Sometimes, and, and we do it because we have the opposite problem from Kunti Devi's. So we have a problem that we might only go to Krishna for material things and not for something else. So that's why the injunction that is given to us is try not to ask material things from Krishna. Because it's a, that's our stai bhav. That's what we, we would operate on. But for a devotee, everything is, where else will the child go? Everything is okay as long as you ask from Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. And this, this is a good segue into the next verse. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so we'll do verse 41. Atha vishesha vishwatman vishwamurte sukveshumi snehapasham imam chindi dradam pandu shuvrishnishu. O Lord of the universe, soul of the universe, O personality of the form of the universe, please therefore sever my tie of affection for my kinsmen, the Pandavas and the Vrishnis. So this verse is a non sequitur. If you look at the flow of the prayers, Kunti Devi is saying, give me this, give me this, give me this. And and then Kunti Devi realizes that Ajuta Mataji is going to ask that what is the nature of Kunti Devi? That she's only asking for material things. So now she's asking for something else. So what is she asking for? She's saying that she's saying that please sever my tie of affection for my kinsmen, the Pandavas and the and the and the, and the Vishnis. So, so the Acharyas say that, and of course Kunti Devi, as you were saying, is an exalted devotee. But the, for but for the sake of demonstrating to us, the Acharyas say at this point, Kunti Devi realizes that she is being selfish. Why is she being selfish? Because she is saying that you stay in Hastinapur, you protect me, and you protect the Pandavas. But if Krishna was to stay in Hastinapur, he cannot be in Dwarka. Which means that she is being unfair to the family in Dwarka, to the Vrishnis and the Yadus and the and the Bhojas, which is who are also Kunti Devi's family. So they are her birth family. So, so she's she's getting into this. So she's getting into this mood. That is this my mentality. That for my own pleasure, I am wishing the unhappiness of somebody else. And in this case, it is Krishna's association. But this applies in a larger format to 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 us. That that when we ask for something. Then the mood is that should be asked in a way that it helps everybody or deprives somebody else. So Kunti Devi at this point realizes that I'm actually being unfair. I'm depriving the Vrishnis because of my affection for the for the Pandavas. So she is she says Dridam Sneha Pasham. So she is firstly. Uh, not not justifying it, but explaining that why why how come how did she reach this point? She says dridam sneha pasham that I have this drid, drid means strong dridam sneha I have this pasham the strong ropes of affection. Pasham is actually means a noose. The, the nature of the noose is that the more you pull against it, the tighter it gets. 
So didam sneha pasham, that this noose of affection that is very, very strong, I have that around me. And for whom? Svakeshu. For my own family. Swa is my own. For my own family, which is not good. So Krishna and I am going to ask you for one more. She says, Imam Chindi, please cut it off. So Krishna might ask that cut it off where? You have family both in Hastinapur and in Dwarka. So she says, Pandeshu, Vrishneshu. Cut it off with both of them. I don't want to have any any uh, didam sneha pasham with any one of any one of them. So you notice that in this verse, Kunti Devi, she calls Krishna by three names. So see, she says, Vishvesha, O Lord of the universe, Vishvatman, O Soul of the universe, Vishvamurti. O personality of the universal form. So she is invoking Krishna as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagwan. So when she is calling Krishna as Vish as Vishvesha, as one who is the Lord of the universe, she is addressing him as the Brahma. And then she says Vishvatman, as the soul of the universe, Paramatma, and Vishvamurti. Murte's personality. She is addressing him as Bhagwan. So she is saying that in these three forms, you are everywhere. As Brahman, you are omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. As Paramatma, you are inside me and outside me. So you can't say that Kunti Devi, I don't have access to your heart because you are sitting in my heart as Paramatma. And as Bhagwan, you are standing right in front of so the fact that Kunti Devi is invoking Krishna in such a strong mood also gives us a glimpse into the strength of this attachment. So Kunti Devi is a very exalted, liberated soul. And, but she's also saying that I need all the help that I can get. As, 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 as Brahman, as Paramatma, as Krishna, Swayam Bhagwan, just in order to, to for, for this Imam Chindi, just to cut off this Radham Sneha, Pasham Sukeshu. That these are so strong that Krishna, with all his energies, as Brahman, Paramatma, and, and Bhagwan, I'm, I'm praying to you to come and cut off this, this, uh, these, uh, ropes. So this is a verse that brings forth the mood of Vairagya in Kunti Devi. So it is said that after Kunti Devi recited this, these prayers, she developed complete renunciation. She lost all interest in family life. So, so either because of the benediction of Krishna or because her own realization, she actually achieved this the state. Um, in the, in the Mahabharata, it is in Bhagavatam, it's a little different. In Mahabharata, it's mentioned that when Dhritarash and Gandhari left, then Kunti Devi left along with them for the forest. And when uh, Dhritarash and Gandhari, they gave up the body, at that time, Kunti Devi also gave up the body, which happens in the very uh, next chapter. No, not in the next chapter, a few chapter, 13th chapter, Dhritarash quits home. So, So in, in, the, in the purport to this verse, Srila Prabhupada, he gives a deeper meaning of renunciation. And uh, so, so I want to, so today we started at 7, right? So we end at 8.30. So that means I stop at 8.15 for questions. Okay. Yes, Roji, we have a hard stop at 8.30. There's another class that will start. These are the classes. Okay. So, 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 the, so there is a uh, there is a basic flaw in the process of 
renunciation. So when I so let's assume I say that uh, um, I renounce eating good food, or I say I renounce my family. What is the basic flaw in this mode? The I, of the I factor. I'm renouncing. Some, some, something more. I mean, you're on the right path, but something more. This is not uh, your family or your property to start with. So you are renouncing. Yeah. So when you when you renounce in that mode, the presumption is that it belongs to me. So Prabhupada gives the example of a person going to a bank and saying, I renounce all the money in the bank. So it did not belong to him to begin with. So what's the value of that renunciation? So similarly, what's the value of a renunciation when Isha Vasim Jagat Sarvam? That everything belongs to, 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 uh, to Krishna. So when some devotees hear this explanation, they say that from today we have renounced renunciation. So then they become, they become super attached to everything. That's an that's an iskon joke. It's not it's not actually factual. <clears throat> but sometimes devotees they'll joke with one another that Prabhu, I'm so advanced that I have renounced renunciation. So so back to the purport, Prabhupada says that the nature of renunciation that is on this platform, that I own it and I give it up constrains you. The example is that when a person takes sannyas and he renounces his family, now let's assume that he has 20 members in his family. Now th there are 20 people that are outside his sphere of interaction. So he has constrained his sphere of interaction. If somebody says that I've renounced the city and I'm living in the jungle. So the 1 million people who live in the city are now outside his sphere of interaction. So now it has become further constrained. Somebody says, I renounce this whole world. So all the living entities are now outside his sphere of interaction. So as one becomes, becomes more and more wider in the sphere of renunciation, they actually become more and more constrained. So Prabhupada talks about real renunciation in the purport. He says that a pure devotee cuts off the limited ties of affection for his family and widens his activities. So this is the opposite effect. That a renunciation for a devotee is going from constraint to a wider perspective. So when a devotee says, I renounce my family, what they mean is that the whole world is my family. So now instead of having 20 family members, you have 20 million family members. When a devotee says that I, I renounce, uh, when, when I, I renounce my city, then effectively the whole world becomes his roaming grounds. So the nature of renunciation that is done from a platform of bhakti is actually, is actually more uh, widens one's perspective. It makes the person more liberal. Um, so in uh, uh, Prabhupada gives the example of uh, Lord Ramchandra, that he gave up his, he renounced his wife so that he could, so that he could embrace his kingdom. So, so the nature of renunciation is that it expanded the, now Lord Ram was, it, 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 uh, that the Prabhupada gives at past time it's a little it's it's one that requires a lot of discussion, but superficially we can see that's what happened. That he Lord Ram felt that the people in his kingdom were not happy. At least one person was not happy with Sita Devi, and he did not want that to happen. So he gave up Sita Devi so that so that the he could embrace the kingdom. In the Hitopdesh, there's a verse that says, "For a magnanimous person, the whole world is your is your." Uh, is your family. So, so what Prabhupada and the Acharya say, when Kunti Devi is saying they cut off my affection with the Vishnis and, and, the, and, the, and the Pandavas, what she's actually saying is 
they cut off my sense of only having affection for these people. I should be at a platform where I should have affection for everybody. So you see Kunti Devi, she's expanding her scope. She was asking protection for herself. Then she was asking protection for her family, then for the kingdom. Now when she's saying cut off, cut off my ties, she's asking protection for the whole world or the whole universe. So that is the, so that is the, uh, the, um, uh, what is it called? That, uh, that a Vaishnava by nature is magnanimous. So that is the magnanimity of Kunti Devi that is coming through if you look at the undercurrent of her prayers. <clears throat> so there's a pastime of Srila Prabhupada in this respect that uh, um, Srila Prabhupada was once uh, shown a picture of a sannyasi. And there was a person standing in front of the sannyasi with a plate. And the plate was full of money. And the sannyasi had his hands behind his back saying, I have, I, I'm a sannyasi, I have nothing to do with money. And Prabhupada looked at the picture and he laughed and he said, if somebody came to me with a plate full of money, I would take the money and the plate and use it in the service of Krishna. So, so that is real renunciation. So real renunciation is not renouncing the object of the desire. It is, the higher to it is by, by renouncing the desire uh, for the object. And even higher than that is, is entertaining the desire to use that object in the service of Krishna, which is essentially what Rupa Goswami calls as Yukta Vairagya. The Anasaktasya Vishyan Yatartam Upajanda Nirbandha Krishna Samande Yukta Vairagyam Uchyate. Okay. So we'll go to the next verse. Any questions on this? Prabhuji, Hare Krishna. Uh, Prabhuji, like uh, I understood the real renunciation, but here the question is the Mayavad kind of renunciation. They want to renounce and they, they want to avoid certain things. So when they want something and they are reaching it, how it can be constraining because they only want to go out of city they want to avoid people and they are achieving it so two ways to understand it uh, so one way is going back to the original paradigm that who is the who is the center of this activity right they are the center of the activity so they are like uh, i don't want to be in the city because it is good for me. They don't care about the city or the people in the, in the, in, in the, in the city, right? The second aspect is the city was never yours to begin with. So how can you give up something that didn't belong to you? So that's why it's Falgu Vairagya. And that's why through that process of renunciation, what happens? Prabhupada says what happens when people follow that process of, process of renunciation, they, they become increasingly constrained and their heart becomes very hard. And Prabhupada says that the, the, that the seed of bhakti will never take root in a heart that is hard. <clears throat> okay, so we'll do the next verse, 1842. Tvaimenanya vishaya matir madhupate sakrat O Lord of Madhu, as the Ganges forever flows to the sea without hindrance, let my attraction be constantly drawn unto you without being diverted to anyone else. So now we see Kunti Devi transitioning from the so-called material platform to the spiritual platform. The fulcrum being renunciation. So asking, 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 then realizing that so much asking is not good for me. So then Krishna says that you have asked me to sever your ties with, with, the, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, with, the, with the Vrishnis and the Pandavas. So if I, if I cut your ties of affection, then 
And Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur, as usual, he plays it off as a conversation between Kunti Devi and Krishna. So Krishna is saying, if you cut your affection with the Vrishnis and the Pandavas, who are my dear devotees, you will cut your affection with me also. Kunti Devi says, but I just want to be attached to you and only you. So Krishna says that, okay, so that means you want to be impersonal. You want to be attached to my Brahman form because you don't want to do anything with my devotees. Kunti Devi says, no, no, your devotees are not different from you. Without affection for them, affection for you cannot take place. So Krishna says, but in the previous verse, and I'm also, so this is more than what Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says, I'm embellishing for effect. So, so Krishna says, in the previous verse, you said, Sneha Pasham Imam Chindi, Rhythm Pandashu, Krishnashu. That please cut off these rows of affection that are binding me to the Pandavas and Vrishnis. So Kunti Devi says that I am praying that you cut the material affection that arises from bodily identification. I want to cut that affection which causes bondage. So then Krishna says, then what is it that you want to preserve? The answer to that question is this verse. That just as the Ganga carries a full stream of water to the ocean, which is the shelter of small and large rivers, may my mind also carry its affection to you, who are the shelter of all devotees. Just as the Ganga does not consider any obstacle on its course, my mind also should not consider any obstacles arising from bodily conception while thinking of you. So, um, Srila Prabhupada has a nice purport that uh, distills these points that Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur makes. So, the first point that he makes is that devotion to Krishna does not mean the negation of all emotions. So, Prabhupada says that desire cannot be negated, but in devotional service, the desire is changed only for the service of Lord in place of desire for sense gratification. The so-called affection for family, society, country, etc. consists of different phases of sense gratification. So this is what Kunti Devi was asking, family, society, country. When the desire is changed for the satisfaction of the Lord, it is called devotional service. So here Kunti Devi is asking for Shuddha Second point Prabhupada makes in the purport is exclusively Krishna does not mean no one else. Everybody has a relationship with Krishna. And exclusive means I don't want to do with anything that is not related to Krishna. So I'm only related to Krishna and those who are in relationship to Krishna. And uh, uh, Prabhupada in the purport, he also gives he also gives concession to Kunti Devi's prayers for her sons. So he says that her affection for the Pandavas and the Vrishni is not out of the range of devotional service because the service of the Lord and the service of the devotees are identical. So, so he, in a way he's doing it retroactively, but he is retroactively retrofitting the mood of Kunti Devi. So when we were reading the, the, the prayers top down, then yes, the sense we got as, as, as Ashuta had pointed out, it seems to be a prayer for material comfort. But now, now when we look back and we say that actually, the reason Kunti Devi is asking for Hastinapur to be flourishing is because she sees them in connection with Krishna. The reason she is asking for protection for the Pandavas is because she understands that they are devotees of Krishna. So now the whole prayer becomes one of devotion. So that is the beauty of this prayer. That you read it top down. It's a prayer that it takes one from the platform of material to spirituality. You read it back. It is a prayer that is anchored right from the very first verse in spirituality. 
so this these uh, uh, these two verses they demonstrate the two essential tattvas of making devotional advancement which is material detachment and spiritual attachment so in the previous verse kunti devi had said that severe my ties of material attachment in this verse she is saying that let my mind flow to you only spiritual attachment so and and this is for sadhakas that as we as we practice devotional service we develop material detachment and we develop simultaneously spiritual attachment okay so the next verse is the last verse any questions on this okay so let me do the last verse and then we'll try and we'll we'll try and just study the prayers uh, from a structural basis so 1843 si krishna krishna sakha vrishne rashabhavani durga durga rajanyavam sadahan anapavarga virya गोविंद गोद्विजाशुरारती हरवतारा योगेश्वर अखिल गुरु भगवान नमस्ते ओ कृष्ण ओ फ्रेंड ऑफ अर्जुन ओ चीफ अमंग्स द डिसेंडेंट्स ऑफ वृष्णि यू आर द डिस्ट्रॉयर ऑफ दोस पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज व्हिच वर डिस्टर्बिंग एलिमेंट्स ऑन दिस अर्थ योर पावर इज नेवर डिट्यूरेट्स यू आर द प्रोप्राइटर ऑफ द ट्रांसेंडेंटल अबोड एंड यू डिसेंड to relieve the distress of the cows the brahmanas and the devotees you possess all mystic powers you are the perceptor of the entire universe you are the almighty god and i offer my respectful obeisances bhagwan namaste so this is the concluding verse of the prayers of kunti devi and it's also a summary verse it summarizes krishna's position this verse appears twice in the bhagavatam this time it is recited by kunti devi it appears in the 11th canto recited by sukadev goswami the first two lines are the same the second two lines are changed a little bit but the the uh, the purport of the verse remains the remains the same i'm sorry it appears in the 12th canto 11th chapter um 11th chapter uh, somewhere in the 11th chapter so if you look at this uh, if you look at the verse it starts with sri krishna so this is the object of the verse that the verse is about sri krishna this is the object of the prayers the prayers are for sri krishna so the verse is summarizing the prayers to some extent then krishna sakha so krishna sakha is 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 uh, arjun and uh, uh, <clears throat> so i mean krishna sakha is krishna as the uh, so proper translates uh, sri krishna krishna sakha and proper translates it as o friend of arjun so she is he trans so one of arjun's name is krishna just like drupadi's name is krishna arjun's name is also krishna krishna means dark complexion so krishna sakha is one who is friend of krishna so uh, one of friend of arjun in this case then say so vrishnaya rishab o chief of the of the vrishni dynasty avani druk rajanya vamsa dhana o an highlighter of the dynasty of the rebellious kings on earth anaparvagya virya one whose power never diminishes and one who removes all pavarga so pavarga we had some discussions on it in in i think the third chapter of the first canto but uh, propad has a very interesting spin on the word pavarga he explains it in the 71325 purport that how pavarga is the hindi per 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 and how each one of them represents a material entanglement so a pavarga is one who takes away the pavarga so that is krishna's position govinda proprietor of golok dham avatar godvij 
Sura Artihar, that one who descends to relieve the dis distress of cows. And Go is also Mother Earth, to relieve the distress of Mother Earth, the Brahmanas and the demigods. And the next three are, are basically attributes of Krishna. Yogeshwara, Akhila Guru, Universal Preceptor, and Bhagwan. And she concludes with Namaste. So the first two uh, attributes, Krishna Sakha, Vishnu Sakha, they are invoking Krishna's relationship with his devotees. Then uh, the third one invokes Krishna's relationship with his non-devotees, that he annihilates them. And the third one is, is Avantaki Druk, that oh, annihilator of the dynasties or rebellious king. Then four, five, and six, they are Krishna's pastimes with his devotees. One whose power never diminishes, one who removes all pavargas, one who is the proprietor of Golok Dhamma, where devotees reside, one who descends to relieve distress of Go Brahman Devaya. So these are these are the pastimes that Krishna performs with his devotees. And 7, 8, 9, which is Yogeshwara, Akhila Guru, Bhagavan, is Krishna's position as the personality of Godhead. So this verse summarizes the prayer of Kunti Devi. Krishna is God. He protects his devotees. He annihilates the non-devotees. Namaste. We offer our obeisances unto him. Okay, so we'll stop over here and um, um, see if there's any questions. If not, then we can kind of do the prayers and see if there's any questions that come up during the prayers. Anybody has specific questions on this verse? We can we can take it quickly. Um, Hare Krishna Prabhu, this is not regarding the verse. Just I wanted to know, which days are we having class these days? It's uh, supposed to be uh, uh, Monday and Wednesday, but actually next week I'm traveling, so I won't be able to have the class either on Monday and Wednesday. So then we decided to have one class today. This is out of cycle, just so that we could finish the prayers of Kunti Devi. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so so let's so let's uh, uh, so let's look at the prayers. Uh, step back and look at the prayers. So the prayers of Kunti Devi, they come in the category of samparthana, atmika. So initially, when we were reading prayers, we said there are three kinds of prayers. There is samparthana, atmika, which is considered to be the to be the basic prayers. And the focus on these prayers is some means complete, is to basically, is tatvagyan to a great extent, to have more understanding of Krishna's relationship, Krishna's identity, devotees' relationship, mostly tatvagyan. Um, the, uh, the higher levels of, uh, of prayers, which are, uh, 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 which are danya, which is expressing, um, uh, humility, we see glimpses of that in, in this. So, and obviously the prayers are natural outpourings. They don't 100% comply to a category, but they predominantly, they come in the category of Samparathimika. Sam the, the third category, which is Lalasme, we don't see that. That is the, the, the Siddhas. The most advanced devotees they they recite those kinds of of uh, prayers. So we had also studied that the prayers are typically have four components in them. They have this element of glorification. They have humility, asking for benediction, and asking for forgiveness. So. The prayers start from the verse 18, where Kunti Devi begins with establishing the position of Krishna as a personality of Godhead, glorification. So she glorifies Krishna 
<clears throat> as the personality of God had. The next verse is about humility. <clears throat> that she measure, she says that even though Krishna is omnipresent, I can't see. So Krishna is trying his best, but I am I am so fallen that I am not able to 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 see you. And then she says that. But you are visible to the exalted devotees. This is verse 20. Visible to the exalted. I'm going sequentially through the verses now. You are visible to the exalted devotees who are advanced in knowledge and who have the ability to discriminate between matter and spirit. So <clears throat> she is glorifying the qualities that allows one to see Krishna. This is establishing Sambandhagya. That what is what is the uh, what is the nature of the relationship between Krishna and the Jiva? So if you look at the, at the three verses that we talked about, the three verses, they talk about Krishna as being all-powerful, omniscient, uh, present everywhere. She talks about uh, the devotees. She uses herself as an example, unable to see Krishna. And then she talks about the nature of relationship that one who is dependent on Krishna can see Krishna. So that is Sambandhya. The two people that are involved and the nature of the relationship. So Kunti Devi starts her prayers with Sambandhya, which is the basis of devotional life. <clears throat> then in the next, uh, uh, from verse uh, uh, 21 to 23, she talks about Abhide, that having understood a relationship with Krishna, what is the process of establishing? So 21, she talks the famous word Krishnaya Vasudevaya Deviki Nandanayasha by chanting the holy name of Krishna, by meditating on his form, by meditating on his pastimes. One can establish one's relationship with Krishna. So that is Abhide. And Abhide comes again later on in the verse in the prayers also from verses 27 to 31, where Kunti Devi goes a little deeper into it. The verse 24 is Kunti Devi, Kunti Devi expecting the protection of Krishna. We have your protection. Thank you so much. You protected us in so many ways, from the poison cake and from the fire and from cannibals. Thank you so much for protection. So what is that? That is Prayojan. So what is the result of Abhidai? One becomes one, one becomes Abhai. One gets complete protection of Krishna. So from 18 to 24, Kunti Devi gives us, a, in her prayers, she gives us a glimpse of devotional life. We start with Samband, understand the relationship with Krishna, through the process of Abhidai, we establish that relationship, and then Prayujan, we live in that relationship. Now, in from the verse 25, she says that, what are the impediments? That all this is fine. One understands the relationship of Krishna, the Prayujan is, is, uh, is one that is uh, one everybody wants. But, but, uh, but what are the impediments? So from 25 to 28, she's talking about the impediments. And the biggest impediment that she talks about is having faith in material shelter. So, so she uses this term, um, um, I'm forgetting the Sanskrit of the term, uh, it was something gocharam. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. So he uses that twice. He says akinchan gocharam. The next verse she uses gocharam vritha. So the so one, uh, so she's preaching through, through, through. What are the qualities that will make one overcome one's impediment? So the impediment that she talks about is. That that 
uh, when one has faith in the material shelter, one cannot approach Krishna. The other impediment that she talks about is, is uh, considering Krishna to be responsible for your miseries. And the, and the point that she makes is that Krishna is, is detached. Whatever is happening to you is because of your own, own destiny. So she's picking up on the points that experientially people find it difficult to overcome. They find difficult to overcome, over, overcome their faith in the material shelter. They find it difficult to overcome to blame Krishna for their material miseries. And she said Krishna has nothing to has nothing to do with it. So 29, so this gets us all the way to 28. From 29 to 31, this is again uh, back in the area of uh, glorification. So these are verses of glorification. And the reason Kunti Devi talks about glorification over here is in the previous set of verses, she is trying to explain Krishna. She is trying to explain Krishna's gunas, that he is materially neutral, and you are you you uh, um, he's he's available to those who are materially exhausted, but he is not material himself. And then she does not want the person who is reciting these prayers to get into this mood that through these prayers I will understand Krishna. So she, she, she brings forth the, the achintya bhav of Krishna. That Krishna is, that Krishna is inconceivable. And in this, in this set of verses, if you remember, they, she says, why does the unborn take birth? Four verses. The unborn takes birth, the unborn takes birth. So these are all, these are all apparent contradictions that, that she presents. With this, with this mood that we accept these contradictions as completeness of, of, uh, of Krishna. That the unborn appears because to glorify Maharaj Yudhishthir, but maybe the unborn appears because of the prayers of Brahma, but maybe the unborn appears because of uh, 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 the, uh, he wanted to glorify the Yadu Vansha. And then the fourth time she says, to establish the process of devotional service. Rupa says that is the real reason. But ultimately, ultimately, this is it is there to invoke this, this mood of surrender uh, in us. So 36 is from 36 to 40, she brings forth this strong mood of gratitude and surrender. So she talks about Krishna being inconceivable to invoke that mood, and 36 to 40, it that mood that mood grows. So 36 is the glories of hearing, chanting, and 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 preaching. Then 37 is the mood of complete dependence of Krishna. 38 to 40 is acknowledging that Krishna is the source of all ability and auspiciousness. And then 41 onwards is Kunti Devi exclusively asking for Bhakti. So initially the all included everything, material as well as spiritual. From 41 onwards, she peels away that, 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 that sense of asking for materiality. And she says that all I'm asking to you is for, is for devotion, 41. 42 is devotion to Krishna is, devotion to Krishna and his devotees. So she wants to negate any sense of impersonalism. That I am only Krishna's devotion. And 43 is the conclusion and the summary of the prayers. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll recap. 18 to 20, Sammant Gyan, 21 to 23 and 27 to 31, Abhiday, meditating on the Naam, Roop, Gun and Leela of Krishna. 24 is Prayojan. 25 to 28 is Impediments. 29 to 35 is Achintya Bhav, the inconceivable mode. 
36 to 40 is the mood of surrender, gratitude, and 41 to 43 is Shuddha Bhakti, asking for pure devotional service. Okay. Um, a okay. quick question, Bruji, where is forgiveness in this, uh, this the fourth aspect, forgiveness? So there is no forgiveness. So of the four, the, the four aspects in the, in, the, in the prayer, the first that we talked about is glorification. So that appears in verse 18. That appears in verses 21 to 24, 27, 29 to 36 and 43. Humility appears in 19, 20, 25, 26, 28, 37 to 40. Benediction appears in 41, 42. No verses. She, she, there's, that mood is not there. That asking for forgiveness is not explicitly there. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments? Well, Prabhuji? Uh, in one of the words, like uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, there is an element of selfishness in the prayer. I think it is 41, I think. Like, uh, uh, but uh, I could not feel that when she asked to sever the knot of uh, attachment, where is her selfishness? So that verse says, her coming out so the previous verse she was asking for protection she was saying protect my family but the verse 40 is where the mood changes so she so she's saying that i don't want this so she acknowledges uh, so that was the main discussion we had in for that verse right the mood changes where she says i don't want to be selfish And during the retreat, actually, Maharaj uh, uh, you know, included 41 and 42 verses, that material detachment and spiritual attachment. So it's just recollecting when you are sharing. Just 40, 41 and 42. Yes. Right, right, right. Hare Krishna Prabhu, um, this is Nanda Gopal Das. Um, did I miss one thing in the prayer that uh, Queen, Queen Kunti prays that Krishna, when we were in trouble, you are with us, and now that we are, everything is uh, fine and dandy, you are leaving us. So I would rather invite a lot of trouble so that you are always with us. Did you did did it come in the prayer or is it coming afterwards? I don't know that I missed it. No, it comes, I think you may have missed it. I, I think it was maybe either, it was not there in the last lecture, it was in the lecture before that. Oh, okay. Okay, Prabhu, that's all. Okay, so if there are no other questions, we can end here. I just wanted to thank you, Prabhu. Okay. That oh. uh, these verses are so deep, and uh, we need a careful study actually. Even after uh, we need to listen your classes again, and it's very pleasurable to hear your classes. Thank you. Yeah, they're wonderful prayers, and Prabhupada distills a lot of them for, uh, for us. So, thank you. So, thank you. So, Friday, I won't be able to come because I have something. I won't be able to be for the class. So then I will see you um, the Monday after next. And um, we have just a few more verses left to finish um, the eighth chapter, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, and even though I didn't plan it, but uh, fortuitously these verses lead into the next chapter. So the last set of few verses are Yudhishthir's uh, uh, bewilderment and uh, his uh, distress. And then they lead into the, into the next, which is the instructions for, to Yudhishthir from uh, Bhishma Dev. So we'll finish that. We'll finish the eighth chapter and we'll go into the ninth chapter. 
and i think ninth chapter uh, we will start doing more verses at one in one class right as per all our our previous discussions so so ajuta you're going to be or you are prem kishor have you done that work on the unit we need to send that out before the class right yes yeah. sorry, i'll talk to you about that Okay. okay. So if yeah, so we have a week to, to, yeah, to, to do that. So we we'll we'll try and send that out, and then I'll also I'll also prepare accordingly to try and do twenty five verses per class. Okay. Thank you very much. One chakal pata rube as chev ke pas hindu be vacha pati itna pavne bio veshna ve bio namo nama anant poti veshna vrind ki jai shila prabhu pad ki jai. Vidai Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo Hari Krishna Thank you